So good morning everybody. I'm Yusuf Man of the Orthopedic Registrars at Very Mercy. Today we are going to present uh, a topic on finger deformities. It's the last topic, so what I have done today is to concentrate more on the anatomy and the basic mechanism of this injury. And we can, you know, go in detail of the surgical management or the non-operative management if uh, possible at some later time. So we start with the anatomy first. So this is very important slide which gives you a clear you know, picture of how the extensor mechanism or the extensor anatomy works. Because if you understand this picture and uh, understand uh, uh, the tendons in this picture, then probably you'll be able to understand how the deformities are being uh, formed. So we start with the extrinsic extensor tendon. It originates in the forearm, courses over the uh, metacarpophalangeal joint. When they pass through the proximal phalanx, they have an indirect attachment that's in form from the sagittal bands, which come from the volar plate. So they are the primary extensor force across the MCP joint. And then the tendon trifurcates over the proximal phalanx. As we go further, it trifurcates. So there is one central slip and two lateral slips. If you can see over here where my arrow is, the central slip goes, is a continuation of the extensor tendon attaches to the base of the middle phalanx and exerts an extensor force across the PIP joint. Now, as it said, there are two lateral slips. So this lateral slips further go distal and they uh, are joined by the lateral bands and they result in formation of the conjoined lateral bands. These two conjoined lateral bands then converge dorsally and insert at the base of the distal phalanx as a terminal extensor tendon. Now you'd ask me, where did the lateral bands come from? So they are the intrinsic contribution to the extrinsic mechanism. So we have two intrinsic muscles, the introsci and the lumbricals, and they give a contribution in forms of lateral band, which combines with the lateral slip and at the level of the PIP joint to form the conjoined lateral tendons. So these are the two bands and slips. Apart from that, we have the triangular ligament, which is a thin uh, tissue connecting the two conjoined lateral bands over the middle phalanx. And this is very important in uh, stabilizing the conjoined lateral bands. It prevents the separation and volar migration of the conjoined lateral bands when the proximal interphalangeal joint is in flexion. This is quite important uh, uh, in regards to the action when the PIP is in flex position and the, when the PIP is in extension position. So one of the ligaments is triangular ligament and the other one is the transverse retinacular ligaments. They originate from each side of the proximal PIP joint of the volar, uh, 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 from the volar plate and they go dorsal into the adjacent conjoined band and they stabilize the conjoined lateral band and they limit the dorsal migration of the conjoined lateral bands during the uh, when the PIP joint is in extension. So these two ligaments which I have talked about are very important for the deformities which we are going to talk next. And the last one is the oblique retinacular ligaments. Uh, they usually arise from the flexor tendon sheet and the volar aspect of the proximal phalanx and they cause distally to insert on the dorsal base of the distal phalanx with the terminal extensor tendon and thus they are very important in you know linking and coordinating the PIP and the DIP joint motion. So this was basically the anatomy. I have gone through them fast but you have to again repeat it, go through it to understand what exactly is where the tendons are attached but this is probably all basic you need to understand. Now what exactly is the patho uh, anatomy in this uh, deformities which have been formed after any injury or trauma. So there is a well-balanced system which exists between the intrinsic and the extrinsic tendons and between the flexion and the extension forces across each of the interphalangeal joints. So any injury which either is causing a flexion or extension deformity in one of the interphalangeal joints can lead to you know tendon imbalance and thus would lead to you know an opposite type of deformity in the adjacent PIP uh, IP joint. So, so one of them is going in flexion, the other would go in extension. The first one is going in extension, the other would go in flexion. Now if we consider the DIP joint, then the flexion forces is by the FDP and it is counterbalanced by the terminal extensor tendon. And if we see the PIP joint, the flexion forces are by the FDP and FDS, which are counterbalanced by the extension forces of the conjoined lateral bands and the central slip of the extensor apparatus. 
So this figure clearly you know, shows there are two dots and one dots. So the single dot clearly represents the axis of flexion extension at each joint, while the two dots you know, represents the areas of corresponding tendon at each joint and how they act. So now we start the basic and the main theme of this uh, topic, finger deformities. What are the causes? So I, I have divided into four of them, like systemic causes, traumatic, degenerative, and congenital. In the systemic, we usually see rheumatoid arthritis, gout, and genetic conditions. So we go with systemic first. What are the deformities which, which are resulting into these problems? The intrinsic plus deformity, swan neck deformity, the buttonhole deformity, the ulna drift of the fingers, and the radial deviation of the wrist. This is classical for the rheumatoid arthritis and but can happen in other conditions too. The second one was traumatic. So the mallet finger, which has the extensor digitorum rupture, the jersey finger, which has a rupture of the flexor uh, polysis, uh, rotational deformities and bony deformities post the finger fracture. And if you have a nerve deformity, you have a uh, nerve problem, and for example, arna, you get into a claw hand. What about degenerative? So we have generally OA, so you have the Herbidens and Boucher's nodules and leads to deformities of the finger. And last but not the least, the congenital. It's not that common, but can result into a lot of deformities. Problems in formation of part like radial and ulna club hand. Failures of the part of hand to separate simple and complex syntactally. Duplications of the finger like polytactily, undergrowth, overgrowth of the fingers, and finally is a congenital constriction band syndrome. These are usually rare and I won't be going in detail into them. So now we start with the major deformities. So this is a classical picture after a rheumatoid arthritis and how you can see the radial deviation of the hand at the wrist, the ulnar deviation of the fingers at the MCP, and the dorsal subluxation of the ulnar head. We start with the first deformity, the swan neck deformity. So if you see the finger, it's quite obvious, you know, it looks like the neck of the swan with uh, the flexion of the distal interphalangeal joints, hyperextension of the PIP joint, and sometimes even the flexion of the MCP joint. There you go. Attention staff, next hall, ward 23, room 9. Now if I go further, what, what is the cause of it? So the, it is usually caused by a muscle imbalance and may be passively correctable on table depending on the fixation of the original and the secondary secondary deformities. This word fixation is very important in swan neck deformity, which I'll go in detail. Usually occurs in rheumatoid arthritis, but can occur in patients with you know genetic conditions such as Ehlers Danlos syndrome too. So this picture clearly shows you know there are two mechanisms or two ways the deformities can form. So may begin as uh, the deformity may begin as a mallet deformity associated with the rupture of the extensor tendon at the distal joint. So first the the tendon ruptures over here. And this results what? You know, laxity of the PIP joint and now the central tendon, which is overpowering, overpowering the distal tendon, starts to, you know, hyperextend the proximal interphalangeal joint. And at this stage, initially, you know, the proximal interphalangeal joint may be still able to flex normally, but as time passes, it further deforms and gets into a fixed position. So this is one of the way. The deformity may begin even at the proximal interphalangeal joint because of synovitis and or any other medical condition causes herniation of the capsule and this results in tightening of the lateral bands and the central tendon and eventually you know the adherence of the lateral band in a fixed dorsal position so they go dorsally and they can no longer slide over the condyles when the proximal interphalangeal joint is flexed. So, you know, you can't flex the PIP joint now and they remain in hyperextension because the lateral bands have subluxate dorsally and they are fixed now. Beautifully classified by nail bath classification in 1989, type 1, 2, 3, 4. If you see the main here, what he I have I have done out, basically the classification has done is concentrate on the PIP joint. So type 1 is wherein, you know, the PIP joint is still flexible there is no intrinsic muscle tightness or loss of function. Type two, the PIP joint flexion is limited in certain positions with there is involvement of intrinsic tightness and limited motion of the PIP 
uh, with extended MCP and with ulnar deviation. Type three is wherein the PIP joint is like, you know, limited uh, flexion in all positions, although the X-rays look pretty normal at this time. While the fourth one is the PIP joint are pretty stiff. You get radiographic appearance of poor joint, you know, cartilage damage and uh, the joint is deformed. So I've just next shelled the basic management of a rheumatoid hand and how we go in the four stages we have seen. So early synovitis or tenosynovitis, usually the non-surgical therapy would work. Persistent synovitis of more than six months, consider for a tenosynovectomy or a synovectomy. Specific deformities, you require reconstructive surgery and severe crippled deformed hand, you probably require salvage surgery. So simple management of this uh, deformity, figure of eight splints, FDS tenodesis, lateral band mobilization, and finally, if nothing work, arthrosis or arthroplasty. They have also classified, you know, the type one, two, three, four, and then what you do in each type of deformity. So if you go in one, the you don't have to do anything on the MCP joint, but in PIP and DIP, you probably need dermatosis, that is the skin release, the FDS sling, or the ORL re re reconstruction. In two, you have to even do the intrinsic release because they are now having flex, uh, fixed uh, flexion, limited flexion of PIP in certain positions. And for PIP and DIP, it remains the same. So if you go three, you require more reconstruction and four, definitely arthroplasty and fusion at some stage. But I'll not go in much detail of that. Now we deal with the second deformity. That is the botanist deformity or the buttonhole. Now the figure beautifully describes how it occurs. So when the middle slip of the extensor tender ruptures and there is no more an inability to extend the PIP joint. So gradually the lateral, sli lateral slip slides vola and the knuckle pops out through the buttonhole and the DIP joint is pulled into hyperextension. So once this is gone, the lower lateral bands, they slide down volally. And now because of the tension of this lateral bands, the distal phalanx will go into hyperextension while the proximal PIP joint will go into flexion and they remain like that. This is again the same how the synovitis can lead to this. And then the stages again, stage one, two and three and four. Stage one is supple, passively correctable. Stage two, fixed contracture with contracted lateral bands. Stage three, fixed contracture with joint fibrosis, collateral ligament fibrosis and volapate contractures. And stage four is uh, PIP arthritis, including all the components of stage three. What would be our aim for treating both this condition? You know, like prevent the extensor tendon rupture completely. So if it is partially ruptured or then, you know, attenuated, try to prevent the rupture, reduce the swelling and pain prevent the PIP joint flexion contracture, prevent the subluxation, prevent the oblique retinacular ligament contracture, restore the active and the passive range of motion of all the joints, maintain the uh, range of motion of the uninvolved joints in the upper, upper extremities, and then get back the patient to previous level of function. But it all depends on what stage you are and what you need to do for that. So these were the two major deformities which I wanted to talk. The last one which is very common is the mallet finger which I'll be discussing, it, in, it usually involves the uh, injury at, uh, involves the disruption of the extensor mechanism at the distal interphalangeal joint. Other names are baseball finger or drop finger, as the uh, picture clearly shows. So the most common mechanism is what, like sudden force of flexion at, of the extended fingertip. So you have your fingertip extended and then you suddenly flex it. It can lead to either stretching or tearing of the tendon, or it can lead to an avulsion of the tendon uh, from the dorsum of the distal phalanx with or without a bony fragment. So as the picture clearly shows how it works. And then depending upon whether the thin extensor tendon is stored in its substance or pulls off of a small piece of bone at its insertion, they are recognized as mallet finger of bony tendon origin or mallet finger of bony origin. Mechanism of injury, uh, the second one is, which is less frequent, is a forced hyperextension of the DIP joint. And this can lead to, you know, fracture of the dorsal base of the distal phalanx. 
and sometimes even open injuries, laceration crust, injuries of uh, deep abrasions can lead to this, but they are less common as compared to the first one which I taught. So with mallet finger, you have to have a delicate balance between the flexion and extension forces. If this is disrupted, then this leads to discontinuity of the ten, uh, terminal extensor tendon, migration of the extensor apparatus proximally, increased tension tone at the PIP relative to the DIP, and can finally lead to you know early or late swan knock deformity as we discussed in the previous slides that how it starts with a mallet finger. The classification acute and chronic. Acute is those occurring within four weeks of injury and chronic those presenting later than four, week, four weeks of injury. They are again classified by Doll. So Doll has classified into four types. Type one close injury without a small evolution of the fracture of the dorsal base. Type two open tendon injuries caused by laceration at or around the DIP. Type threes are the open injuries. They occur from a deep soft tissue abrasion without skin loss and tendon substance loss. And type four are the mallet fractures. They are again divided into three, A, B, and C. The distal phalanx facial injury in pediatrics. Uh, two is the fracture fragment involving at least 20 to 50 percent of the articular surface in adults. And type C are fragments which are more than 50 percent of articular surface in adults. How can you see it clinically? Quite easily visible uh, with pain, deformity, and difficulty using the affected finger. They cannot extend the finger completely. Inspection, look at the soft tissue, look at the deformity. They may, may develop immediately or may even take a few hours or days to get it. And there is a concurrent hyperextension of the PIP, that is run neck posture, may be noted with active finger extensions. You can palpate it and there will be tenderness at the acute injuries. The range of motions measures the finger at MCP and the PIP joint motion, how they are going. Definitely get an x-ray on it, get an uh, anterior posterior AP x-ray, a oblique and a lateral are recommended to assess the bone injury and the joint alignment. And finally, the treatment options. Generally, the non-surgical is successful in most of the cases, but uh, there are uh, times when it, it is chronic and it is you know not reducing, then you probably require to salvage the treatment with uh, surgical methods. There are a number of surgical methods the best one is the extension block pinning, which clearly shows in this picture. So you probably extend them with the splint or you probably put a fire through the joint and you have ex blocked the tendon through one of the pins. The next one I want to discuss is the jersey. It's the opposite of the mallet. It's due to the evolution of the flexor digitorum profundus from its insertion on the distal phalanx and is seen in football and rugby guys. And then we have classification as per Lady Parker, three types, type one, two, and three. This is very important. The type one is the worst one, the figure shows. So the tangent ruptures here and then ends up over here. So that like, you know, probably you have to go surgically, open it, retract the tendon back if possible. Type two is the tendon tear and only retracts a little. While the third one is the tendon tears, but does not retract at all. And all of they have their specific management. This is all I have for today. Uh, we probably can discuss the treatment part in much more detail uh, at a later stage. Thank you very much.